The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some religious leaders came, and to test Jesus they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The gospel of our Savior. Praise to you, Lord Christ. children we love? Surely, Mary and Joseph ask those questions. God invites us in whatever way God reaches us, sometimes traditional, sometimes a little unusual. God reaches us and invites us 
to bear the love of God into the world, to give the light of Christ a home within us, within our households, within our community, so that the whole world might know that love and that light and then move into transformation because we know this world is hurting and broken and needs reconciliation and healing and wholeness. God gives us, each of us, spirit, spirit, a center somewhere. I don't know where to locate it when I'm pointing. I'm always pointing with my hands. But God gives us spirit and locates that, sp that spirit somewhere in the center of us, in the core of our selfhood. And that spirit is interwoven in God's spirit throughout our whole lives, that never changes. So we might periodically ask ourselves, what does that spirit inside of me need right now? And then, like Mary and Joseph before us and every other person who ever cared and nurtured and protected and loved, a child in the maturity and fullness, we will care and nurture and protect and love our spirit, our spiritual core into maturity and fullness. Our spirit acts as navigator and compass for the life that we are called to live. It steadies us through those challenges and surprises of life. And it points us, sometimes turning us a little bit, to point us in a direction of wholeness and peace and freedom and healing. We do not talk about our spiritual self very much, do we? It's fuzzy. It's fuzzy and hard to talk about. It's hard to describe. It's easier, in fact, to tell somebody else what our child, our dog, or our cat is up to than to tell anyone what our spirit is up to. When was the last time we did that? It takes a lot of focus and honesty and clarity to observe our spiritual core at work. Many of us struggle to articulate what our spirit knows or senses or directs us to do. To tend our spirit is to know ourself and to know God more fully and then to live in that space of absolute intimate connection God so near that God is within. Intimate connection with God. It is our life's work to know who we are, to figure it out, and then to live with other people who are figuring themselves out in harmony. It is our life's work as beloved children of God to claim our selfhood, that gift of being a unique and distinctive and creative and holy and fabulous part of God's creation. That's our life's work, to claim it, to live it. Selfhood refers to an understanding of who you are. And having a fairly balanced picture of your areas of strength and vulnerability and the things you're working on, selfhood means that you know what you value and you behave in ways congruent with those values. And then when you don't, when you mess up, and you don't really live in a way that's congruent with your values, you back up, you pause, and you say to yourself, self, what's up? What are we doing? And so your self-understanding deepens. You grow in an honest relationship with your own self. With a healthy self-understanding, a person can do this really, really tricky thing of staying connected with another person despite that person having really different values from your own. Even when emotions are running high and are really intense 
and makes uh, make us want to do that, that really instinctive thing of fight, flight, freeze, we can stay connected. Stay connected. Selfhood looks like admitting mistakes without beating ourselves up. Selfhood looks like forward motion through a really painful situation. Selfhood is taking a clear stand in the face of pressure to do something else. When we know who we are deep down in our spirit, then we come to a place where we can more gently respect the different values of another person while maintaining our own values. We, we learn to untangle what our selfish ego wants from what our spirit is called by God to do. In our relationships, we learn to connect and trust one another with our true selves. Sometimes we struggle to just know ourselves. It's hard enough to know other people, but gosh, isn't it difficult sometimes to know ourselves, to know our true self? We push that work aside and power on with more tangible things. I do this often. Do you? There's this to-do list, these tasks that need us, and they're not so fussy, so hard. So we set aside that deeper soul work, and we just get on with the work of the things right in front of us, tangible stuff. So I want to share a story about when I was doing that tangible thing and got called up short. I remember this middle of the night moment in my life really well. It's never going to leave me, I think. I laid in bed restless, which is not like me. I sleep very well, thanks be to God. But one night I couldn't sleep. I was so restless. I was churning inside. I could, I could not rest. I was so ill at ease. I was turning in the bed. I couldn't get comfortable. And I wasn't comfortable on the inside. After a few hours like that, which felt like forever, I sat up in bed and I said out loud, which is important because I had a sleeping baby next to me in this little sidecar bed thing attached to our bed. And then I have this husband next to me sound asleep. I had to get up early and go to work. But I sat up in bed and I said out loud in a clear voice to God, okay, God, what do you want? And I listened, and I looked out the darkness of the window. Eventually, I said in a quieter voice, barely daring to say it out loud, I said to God some really hard words. I said to God, I can walk away. I can walk away. Even though I'm about to graduate from seminary in a few weeks, and there's an ordination date set on the cathedral calendar a few weeks after that, and I've accepted a job at a church already, I can walk away if this is not your will, God. As I released that truth and waited on God to respond, I could see the faces of all these people that had loved me through that ordination process that were planning on me becoming a priest someday. I could see faces of priests, of mentors, of friends, my spiritual director. And yet I knew in that moment something I needed to know, which is I could walk away if it was not God's will. And knowing that, gave me the gift of such peace. That peace washed over me and my whole body relaxed and I felt right asleep. In my life, peace comes when I dare to be honest with God. At that moment, when I am least inclined to be honest with God. When I'm most afraid to be honest, and then I'm honest, then God and I are really connected. 
and peace washes over me. Throughout the scriptures, when people come before God, before Jesus, to find healing, to be saved, they are doing something that's hard to do. It's not like it's easy to get out in front of a crowd of people and start clamoring for Jesus' attention. It's difficult. It's embarrassing. It's a little scandalous. They're making themselves vulnerable. They're being so honest. I think it's funny in our text today that these people are grilling Jesus about divorce and marriage, and his own entrance into this world did not follow the regular rules of a respectable family. Jesus' birth was a scandal. We forget that because the Christmas cards are so pretty that we send each other. We forget that it was a total scandal. From the unexpected pregnancy to the manger filled with hay and other stuff. And Jesus chose over and over again to scandalously forge these powerful, spirit-connected relationships with the people that society was trying to ignore and get rid of, trying to silence. People found these outcasts, these lepers, these prostitutes, these tax collectors who were so unscrupulous, this woman with five husbands, society found them so scandalous. And Jesus got into relationship with these folks that they might find peace and healing and wholeness. And then he drew them, just as they were, scandal and all, into being a part of his plan for creation, drawing all of creation into that healing and peace. Jesus invites you and me to pause from the grind of life and tend the life of your spirit. Just as there are many, many ways to form a household, there are many, many ways to house the Spirit of God within you. There are many ways to then offer the gifts of that Spirit to the world as a part of God's peace-making presence and love. A friend of mine serves a Spanish-speaking congregation in South Texas, and that might make us think that if they all speak Spanish, they're from the same culture, but they're not. He marvels at all the different backgrounds and countries and cultures and religious upbringings in this Spanish-speaking congregation. This congregation loves their community. They love the opportunity to come together and be spiritual beings rather than being cogs in the wheel of commerce and production. I think that's true for all of us, really. Worship is a time to gather in the presence of the one who created us to be spiritual as well as physical beings. Worship is where we come together to praise God for that gift of the Spirit. So my friend in South Texas invites all the folks in his congregation from all their many backgrounds to give three offerings every week. Ofrendas en español. Ofrendas. Offerings. Three ofrendas. Or tres ofrendas. He asks them to give one hour every week to worship, to come together and worship, one hour. He asks them to give one hour worth of wages to the work of the church community, to put it in the offering plate, one hour of wages. He asks them to then also give one hour each week to their own growth and development as disciples of Jesus to figure out what they need that week to grow more and more into the light of Christ in the world. Is it prayer? Is it studying scripture? Is it caring for a neighbor in need? What is it that you'll do with that hour? God asks us to give of ourselves, to give the love of God to one another, to give our own self, to give the light of Christ a home within our very being, within our households, within our community, so that the whole world might know the love and light and peace of Christ. So today I'm going to ask you one question. 
We'll keep it simple. One question. As you hear this question, trust in God and hear what the Spirit reveals within you. You might want to close your eyes, hear this question, and hear what the Spirit reveals. What does your spirit need right now? What does your spirit need right now? I invite you now to take this knowledge, whatever has been revealed, this leading of the Spirit, and offer it to God. Offer it like something you put in the offering plate. And trust God to bless it. Amen.